foreign nation could possibly do to us, but it also creates a large vulnerability that allows it to be more manipulated or more vulnerable to foreign influence operations. And with that, I'll hand it back over and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that was a really great uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, my name is Saleya Mosin. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News based in Washington. I cover economic policy and that comes out of the uh, Treasury Department. Um, so I think we have met, um, we've met Ambassador Freed and we've just heard from Graham Brookie. I just want to introduce two more of our panelists, Richard Sawaya. He is with the National Foreign Trade Council, who is where he's been since 2009. Uh, and also Carrie Steinbauer, who's a partner at Winston & Strawn, uh, you know, helping uh, clients with uh, compliance with sanctions and Bank Secrecy Act and AML laws. Um, uh, among many other things. And I would like to hear from Richard and Carrie um, what you, th oh, before we get to that, I'm so sorry. Um, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Um, Freed, Ambassador Freed, about his report that he did for the Atlantic Council with Brian O'Toole. Thank you. Um, the question, the policy question the United States faces is what do we do about the possibility of Russian aggression either directed against the United States um, in our elections, which at a light phase is already taking place through disinformation, or aggression in other areas, um, chief among them Ukraine, that where Russia has been conducting a sometimes hot and sometimes uh, low-level war since 2014. There are two sanctions bills extant in, uh, oh, there are more than two bills, but two of them are in relatively advanced stages. The most advanced is so-called DASCA, which was voted out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, last December. That's Defense Against Kremlin Aggression Act. Um, deter is, as the name suggests, um, in the, uh, a bill, designed to focus on only one act of Russian aggression against U.S. elections. DASC is more broad. It talks about actions against Russian aggression, either um, directed against U.S. elections or against Ukraine or against freedom of navigation. So DASC is broad, deter is narrow. Both bills share one important thing in common, they don't punish Russia for past misdeeds. They seek to deter future Russian aggression by imposing by threatening to impose sanctions. Both bills take the sanctions that the Obama administration introduced and the Trump administration continued um, on the Russian financial energy sectors and extend them. They take the next steps. Um, both of them use a complicated mechanism for determining whether Russian aggression beha aggressive behavior either against U.S. elections or against Ukraine has been reached. Uh, it involves a report to Congress either led by or written or solely by the Director of National Intelligence uh, determining whether Russia has crossed a line. If so, then sanctions enter into force, most of them are mandatory. Uh, the our paper goes through the sanctions um, piece by piece. It goes through uh, the mechanism for triggering a US government response, and it tries to unpack various issues. Are sanctions the right tool? Are the sanctions proposed the right specific tools? Is the the trigger mechanism the right one? Is it right to ask the DNI to determine policy? Um, if not, what are the alternatives? Now, I'm not going to go through the, um, the section by section analysis contained in the paper. I think everybody on this call has received the paper. If not, you can go, uh, it was just put in final this morning. You can go on the Atlanta Council website and grab it. Um, it was written by me and my colleague, Brian O'Toole. Uh, put, it's entitled, Pushing Back Against Russian Aggression, Legislative Options. Um, the large question is, are the trigger levels the right ones? Are the sanctions the right ones? 
Um, and the large, the biggest strategic question is, should we be now preparing counter steps to forestall possible Russian aggression against us, against Ukraine, or both uh, later this year? Um, our bottom line assessment, and Brian and I are both ex uh, veterans of the executive branch, is that we really don't like um, sanctions legislation as a matter of principle. We prefer executive action and the flexibility it provides, but the Trump administration has an uncertain track record with respect to Russia and President Trump's dismissal of his intelligence chief because he was displeased with an intelligence briefing characterizing Russian election interference against the United States suggest that as was the case in 2017, the administration may not be credible when it comes to assessing Russian aggression. Therefore, with some regret, we concluded that legislation probably is needed. Um, while we admire deters focus on one issue, we think the Daska's attempt to include both Ukraine, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and Russian aggression against US elections as the chief uh, areas that we want to deter is probably the better bill. All sanctions legislation has faults. Again, we prefer executive branch action, but under the circumstances, we reluctantly came to the conclusion that legislation is probably needed. Uh, DASCA is the most advanced piece of legislation. Uh, in the event that the Senate decided to act, it is the piece of legislation most likely to be chosen because of its relatively advanced stage. It has, perhaps for that reason, attracted a fair amount of attention, including critical attention, um, and I trust Richard Sawaya will address that. He has written our, already about it. So the, um, he, he can sp um, speak for some of the critics of DASCA. But in the end, we think that sanctions can serve a useful function because they indicate to the Kremlin that the United States will impose a cost on Russia for continued malign behavior. Sanctions are an imperfect instrument. They are not a guarantee of success, but we've, the United States and Europe have used sanctions as a principal means of responding to Russian aggression against Ukraine and in other areas. And it is my judgment that without sanctions, Russian aggression would have been considerably worse, including against Ukraine. Um, there's much more to say, much more detail to go into, but I will let that stand as an initial opening. And Saleha, I, I yield the balance of my time back to you and the panel. Thank you, Ambassador Freed. Uh, just to remind our audience, if you're using uh, joining us on Zoom, you can submit your question using the chat button. You can use uh, on Twitter, you can use the hashtag shaping sh sanctions for to send your questions and on Facebook, you can submit them by the comment section on the live stream. So we're hoping that this is an interactive debate, even though we are doing this remotely, but we can prove everyone that this is a successful uh, method of communication. Um, so before I get to Carrie, I, want, I will ask you about the compliance perspective of these two bills. I would like to ask Richard for your um, views of DASCA and um, your, uh, your you, know, you can play the role of devil's advocate for us and, and tell us your side. Well, thank you. Um, I'll start by one observation. Russia in Ukraine and Russian interference in this year's US elections are two different things, substantively and politically. Um, and that said, uh, IEPA gives the president, as uh, Dan has observed, complete authority to sanction Russia uh, upon a finding of unusual and extraordinary threat to national security, foreign policy, 
or the economy of the United States, which is why uh, the ambassador and Brian's best case is no legislative sanctions and quote their general skepticism about making foreign policy through legislation. Um, in 2014, Ambassador Freed was the prime mover as the only sanctions coordinator in the history of the State Department in implementing targeted, flexible, targeted, scalable, and reversible sanctions under IEPA after Russia annexed Crimea and started hybrid warfare in eastern Ukraine. And critically, those 2014 sanctions, as Dan alluded to just now, were coordinated with corresponding EU sanctions, thanks to his work principally. And when the Obama administration acted as it did in 2014, former Senate Foreign Relations Chairman Bob Corker chose not to legislate any sanctions. Flash forward to 2017, post 2016 election, and we had passage of CATSA, countering American adversaries through sanctions, codified and expanded the 2014 executive sanctions, and legislated a congressional national security interest waiver review in the event the executive issued such waivers. CATSO was a bipartisan political response to the exceedingly curious case of Donald Trump and Russia that Dan and Brian describe in their paper. CATSO was passed for the same reason that Dan and Brian reluctantly endorsed DASCA as, quote, the second best alternative to no sanctions legislation at all. But the US and EU sanctions in place have not resulted in the implementation of MINST II. Why would more legislated sanctions at this time do so or be sufficient bar to Russia hard or soft interference in our elections this year? Whatever else they are, sanctions are unfunded mandates on US businesses. And like any mandate, they merit cost benefit analysis. Regarding the Ukraine sanctions post CATSA, can the direct and indirect cost to US companies be justified? With respect to election interference, we have the three volumes from the Senate select intelligence committee. We have, in addition, the just released findings of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, co-chaired by Senator Angus King and Representative Mike Gallagher. Um, to sum up the findings, in a word, the best offense is a good defense, a whole of government defense that focuses on cyber deterrence which would be a large lift for Congress, but more constructive than sanctions. No country in the world has employed sanctions as often as the United States. Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations stratagem of economic coercion of rogue nations has morphed these many years later into US unilateral sanctions given present US dominance over the global financial system. In 2016, then Treasury Secretary Jack Lew issued a strategic caution. Quote, if they make the business they sanctions, the business environment too complicated or unpredictable, or if they excessively interfere with the flow of funds, Worldwide financial transactions may begin to move outside the United States entirely, which could threaten the central role of the US financial system globally. There is a real distinction between targeting a nation state and targeting its policymakers. Since it was signed into law in 2012, 
and expanded legislatively in 2016. The Magnitsky Act and its global follow-on authorizes the administration to sanction individuals deemed responsible for human rights abuses and corruption. And at the end of 2017, President Trump implemented the Global Magnitsky Act, issuing Executive Order 13818 to impose sanctions on individual, quote, human rights abusers, kleptocrats, and corrupt actors. Pursuant to the USA Patriot Act, the US Treasury has developed capacity to interdict money laundering globally. Legislation has passed the House to mandate, ironically, in the case of the US, financial transparency regarding beneficial ownership of assets in the US. Companion legislation is under, is under active consideration in the Senate. US allies have passed similar measures or have such under consideration. I would suggest that sanctions targeting personal fortunes of individual decision makers in the Kremlin could well be part of US strategy towards Russia. Going back to my observation about cost benefit analysis and unfunded mandates, I would conclude given the sanctions on the books and at the disposal of the executive that executive, that congressional legislation is simply not warranted at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, very interesting to hear your perspective. Um, just to remind everyone, DASCA has been proposed by Senators Graham and Menendez, and Deter is uh, proposed by Senators Rubio and Van Hollen. So both of the legislations have um, some bipartisan support uh, as they're making their way through Congress. Um, Carrie, I'd like to hear from you on what you make of one point that Richard touched on, um, just the increasing burden of sanctions on some of your clients uh, in terms of compliance and also how you view um, these two bills and what we've just heard from the gentleman. Sure, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be on such a, a fine panel. I, I think the the first comment I would have is that I agree, agree with Ambassador Freedom with Richard Soya in the sense that uh, the preference would always be to allow the executive branch, the authority to act nimbly under the foreign policy authority. And the reason why I say that is because um, I've watched the private sector reaction to congressionally mandated statutes. And I've also seen the unintended consequences over the years where there have been statutes mandating sanctions on the executive branch. Uh, I think if you go back to 1996, you can see, for example, the Helms-Burton legislation um, with the immediate passage of the Title III waiver under President Clinton, the focus of Helms-Burton in 1996 was non-US businesses that were trafficking and expropriated land in Cuba. If you look to what has happened now many years later, uh, under the current administration, we now have the waiver not in place, and the current administration is, is finding that the results of the now open litigation is that the targets of the litigation are not foreign parties, but actually U.S. persons who are operating, in some cases, under U.S. government authorization in Cuba. And so you can see that where you have statutory authority that's difficult to unwind, and under the Obama administration, there had been quite a few attempts to roll back the Cuban sanctions as far as possible. Uh, the restrictions really were on the legislation that remained uh, embedded in statute and, and very difficult without bipartisan support to roll back. Um, so I think from, from my perspective, the preference is always for the foreign policy realm to be left with the executive branch. But the re second reason why I suggest that is because what we've seen from the CATS sanctions and from, in particular, the April 6, 2018 oligarch sanctions that were implemented uh, in response to the statutory requirements was uh, the unintended consequences. And so what happens when you have the Section 241 oligarchs list and the corresponding April 6, 2018 designations of, of oligarchs, uh, wealthy businessmen associated with, with uh, Putin, 
is that the private sector, as Richard had indicated, uh, takes up the mantle of having to figure out how to implement and enforce the sanctions. So the burden is one that's expensive. Uh, it's one that US business, pre predominantly the financial services sector has been willing and, and um, ha happy to bear. The problem is that the amount of sanctions, the volume of the sanctions and the complexity of the sanctions since 1996 has increased exponentially. And so we're seeing that while the private sector has resources in order to institute compliance programs and in order to engage in dialogues to try to figure out how to implement, implement a structure in order to respond to the rapidly changing sanctions sphere, the Department of the Treasury is not uh, so equally able to adjust. Uh, if you look back to uh, 2000, well, to 1999 and 2001, when the Foreign Asset Control Commission was set up in response to the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act, there was a lot of concern from the private sector with respect to what would happen when you take the Columbia Narcotics Program and make it worldwide. The thought was that it was appropriate to look at putting some form of judicial review mechanism over OFAC, the Department of the Treasury's implementer for sanctions. Uh, the determination back in 1999 and 2000, when the Foreign Asset Control Commission was in place, was that no such judicial mechanism was really necessary because the penalties tended to be around $11,000 as capped under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. OFAC could issue licenses within three to four months, and the number and volume of enforcement actions was fairly small. Uh, What's happened now with this increasing use of sanctions, whether it's from the executive branch or from administer uh, uh, the required statutory sanctions, is that the Office of Foreign Assets Control has not significantly grown in resources since really since 2000. So it, it may have, I think it's up to 260 individuals. But the problem that we're seeing, particularly when you go back to the mandated statutory sanctions like the Section 241 sanctions, is that the private sector uh, is trying to engage with the government, whether it's the State Department or with Treasury, uh, but we're not able to see licenses processed in a rapid fashion. So, for example, there are a number of U.S. businesses who have robust compliance programs uh, who are trying to comply with U.S. sanctions under CATSA, particularly the April 6, 2018 ones, um, and are finding that their license applications remain pending with open. Um, maybe down the road, but if if that's really the determination of Congress that there must be this congressionally mandated uh, role for sanctions, there also should be a nod toward two things. First would be increasing the resources uh, at the Department of the Treasury for the administration of those sanctions. And the second would be taking a, a lead from some of the sanctions or some of the uh, efforts also on the Hill, as Richard indicated, to update the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, the last time it was done was really right after September 11th, 2001. So in both of those components, take into account the need to engage in a, private, in a true private sector government partnership in order to address potential implications of the new sanctions or the new anti-money laundering laws and regulations and put structures in place so that those um, potential unintended consequences or intended consequences can be mitigated as appropriate. So in, in general, um, I do think that I would prefer the foreign policy realm to remain with the executive branch, but in either instance, I do think that a lot can be learned specifically from a private sector government partnership. One of the uh, things that we're seeing in the Bank Secrecy Act reform area is the Counter Act. It's, um, right now it's a House bill but it looks at overhauling the Bank Secrecy Act significantly. One of the components that it considers that might be useful in the sanction space is this concept of setting up um, incubator programs or pilot programs where various techniques uh, under for countering terrorist financing or money laundering could actually be tried out in smaller settings with financial institutions or other covered parties. And in watching what the, the US State Department has been doing in the sanctions realm, specifically with respect to outreach to the insurers and the reinsurers in the maritime space, I think that a lot could be gained 
if we were to set up similar incubator style projects so that, that we do not have um, these broad decrees coming out from the government where it may be that the same problem could be addressed much more nimbly and much more flexibly uh, through, through a more open dialogue. Thank you for that perspective, Carrie. Um, I would like to turn to Ambassador Free just to hear from you, sir, what you make of uh, what Carrie and Richard said. And also after that, if you could talk a little bit about um, why it is that um, you're so uncomfortable with uh, the legislative branch taking over a little bit with in, in regards to sanctions. Um, I've been in several uh, hearing rooms with Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin and uh, senators pressing him on how far we can go in um, crippling the, uh, the Russian economy through sanctions, and it looks like they, uh, they have a more broad understanding of what sanctions do rather than um, the nuanced one that would come from the executive branch. Mr. Freed? Well, Richard and Carrie have listed a number of cautionary points, all of which are right, okay? and understands the operational needs that the operational challenge of conducting intense sanctions programs. And she's absolutely right that OFAC needs more resources. Licensing authority needs to be nimble. Um, the resources have to be sufficient to support rapid turnaround. Partnership with business is critical. Um, Richard and Carrie are both right that implement the executive branch's implementation of CATSA had its rough spots. And Carrie is particularly right that the implementation, that the April 2018 um, implementation of sanctions against oligarchs, uh, particularly Deripaska, was, as I say, clumsily handled and took a lot of effort to unwind. So all of the cautionary points are right. And it is always fraught when the legislature passes detailed sanctions legislation. But why, therefore, are Brian, were Brian O'Toole and I reluctantly persuaded to support the legislation? And because of this. <clears throat> we're not talking about sanctions in the abstract. We're talking about sanctions should the Russians relaunch a military offensive against Ukraine, a war, or if in the event, sanctions in the event, the Russians launched a major assault on US election infrastructure, or a hack and leak operation, such as they launched against um, Hillary Clinton through the um, hacking of the Democratic National Committee. Do we as a country, take either of those acts of Russian aggression seriously enough to put down a line. Second, do we have confidence that the Trump administration would act in response to Russian aggression, either against Ukraine or against the United States? Do I have to spell out the ways in which President Trump has undermined confidence that he takes Russian aggression seriously. He showed ample evidence of regarding Ukraine merely as an instrument of domestic partisan politics. We as a nation have gone through this. The president, as I said earlier, dismissed his director of national intelligence because he didn't like the, the details of a briefing about a Russian election interference. Are we confident that this administration would do the needful. Richard's right, okay? Under IEPA, the basic, the, the foundational sanctions legislation, the executive branch already has the authority it needs to take action. Do we think it will? Are we confident that it would, even in the event of the aggression we're talking about? I'm not sure. But try to imagine a situation in which there's an active war in Ukraine. How would sanctions look to us then? The sanctions in DASCA are sectoral sanctions. They're not just individual sanctions. Um, Richard is right 
individual sanctions have their place. On the Obama administration, um, we did both. We did sectoral sanctions and individual sanctions. But sectoral sanctions have an impact on the Russian economy. They cost it between one and one and a half uh, percentage points GDP growth per year. That's significant. Sanctions put pressure on Russia in ways that yield results sometimes in unexpected fashion. And I have in mind the 1980s when economic pressure against the Soviet Union didn't work at all until it worked a lot. Um, so I would argue that sanctions are Sect and including sectoral sanctions are a useful tool that the administration does not give sufficient confidence that it would act under existing authorities. And therefore that sanctions legislation may be necessary to indicate to the Kremlin that there will be a price paid for an increase of aggression. All of Kerry's cautionary notes and Richard's point about Jack Lew's speech in 2016 about the overuse of, or ill use of sanctions are sound. I mean, I was at Jack Lew's speech and we invited Jack Lew to come to the Atlanta Council uh, in, uh, in the beginning of 2019 to give a, a kind of second look where his concerns had deepened. So it's not that Richard and Kerry are wrong. It's that we don't have the luxury of our first option it's the best, second best, and I will maintain my position that sanctions legislation is reluctantly necessary and the desk is probably the best piece. But I look forward to a lively discussion. And um, by the way, I can't ask for better critics than Carrie and Richard who understand the operational needs of helping OFAC do its job better. And speaking of a lively discussion, uh, just to remind everyone that if you're on Zoom joining us, there is a, a button you can click. Uh, it says chat and you can uh, submit your questions. On Twitter, you can use hashtag shaping sanctions. And on Facebook, you can submit questions through the live stream. Uh, so another question I have, um, and maybe Carrie, you can take this one, is on uh, the sovereign debt provision. Uh, I work for Bloomberg, so anything re relating to bond markets is, is always really big news. Um, I'd like to hear what you think of the the, uh, the trigger response in deter and also the um, provisions in DOSCA that would uh, bring about sovereign debt sanctions, which are part of the um, Russian sovereign debt as part of the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. So what would happen to markets and what do you hear from clients on that point? Sure. So, um, as, as I recall, the provision would kick in under certain circumstances if there was sovereign debt offerings um, of, I think it was more than 14 days. The, the challenge with the bond market, as we've seen from the Venezuela sanctions and also to a certain degree from the Russian sectoral sanctions, is, is one of um, understanding the compliance and, and then, again, being able to identify um, ways for parties to exit uh, the, the holdings that they have. So an unwind provision uh, or a, a white list of certain bond offerings in order for the sort of the world financial system to react and respond uh, to, the, to the imposition of the new sanctions. And so, I mean, I think we can look at, at some of the complications from the Venezuela sanctions in particular, where uh, there was a lot of confusion over when an interest in a bond was was being held and what would be a trigger for allowing um, whitelisting or for unwinding of those sanctions. And so um, I think it's a, it's it's definitely an effective way of imposing targeted sanctions. The the challenge is is in the implementation and the guidance coming out of the Treasury Department, particularly with respect to any white lists. Of, of bonds, um, any guidance that can be provided with respect to unwinding, uh, and then issues relating to things like secondary market trading, where uh, there has been a different approach um, in some sanctions programs with respect to whether secondary market trading is permissible and when, when it's not. Um, similar issues we see also from the North Korea sanctions, where there's a very, uh, there was a very healthy market in secondary debt trading dating back to um, the 1970s uh, foreign trade bank debt. 
Um, and all of that disappeared largely when the sanctions went into effect first from the US and then the European Union on the foreign trade bank. Um, there has been some nod toward allowing secondary market trading in the Russian context. And so I think the question really is when we talk about imposing restrictions on um, sovereign debt or, for, or bonds, what we're really trying to accomplish and whether there would be considerations for wind down activity, I would assume there has been and there would be because um, as we've seen from the CATSA sanctions, um, including Deripaska as Ambassador Freed mentioned, there, there was a successive series of general license extensions that, that took into account the complexities of dealing something like dealing in the area of, of, of complicated transactions or financial services implications where it's not just, uh, you know, thou shalt not deal in this widget coming from this company, but it's, it's really something that will implicate far broader uh, financial services sectors than just, just uh, the, what it would be if it was a widget uh, exchange prohibition. Uh, and Graham, if I could just turn to you for a moment, you were at the Obama administration's White House and National Security um, Council. Uh, what do you think is the challenge for U.S. diplomats who go around the world uh, and have to answer questions on where the U.S. is heading in terms of sanctions when it's not all in the hands of the executive branch? And um, what what are the complications of how sanctions may or may not be signaled when it's uh, something coming from lawmakers? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I mean, it, and it could be evergreenly applied to any number of other topics, but one of the biggest challenges, especially coming out of this kind of uh, era, is going to be for diplomats and, frankly, a number of other civil servants across uh, our national security spectrum uh, having to explain kind of why the bottom won't fall out on our domestic politics, especially with regard to sanctions. I mean, so if you're talking about, it's hard enough to talk about sanctions policy. A lot of this audience uh, is the expert audience on sanctions. Uh, and there are any number of ins and outs and ins and outs, and then more ins and outs of sanctions policy. So that's hard enough for a policymaker to have to explain to a foreign counterpart. That being said, if you add a layer on top of that to have to explain uh, the the dynamics and the politics that are happening on Capitol Hill, it becomes a lot more difficult. And so one of the things that we're going to have to think through just from a workforce standpoint uh, across the national security uh, workforce in the United States uh, projecting abroad is how we explain what our domestic politics looks like on top of a number of very complicated uh, policy issues with a number of trade-offs that sometimes don't have great answers. And so that's that's one thing that regardless of uh, sanctions policy on every single other policy, Paris Climate Accords, uh, things like the Iran deal, we're going to have to be able to sit down at the table and explain exactly why our domestic politics won't change or will change uh, any number of kind of policy dynamics about what we're negotiating at that table. Um, so again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Graham. And again, if you're uh, just joining us uh, uh, through Zoom, then you can use the uh, chat button to submit questions. On Twitter, you can ha use hashtag shaping sanctions. And on Facebook, you can uh, submit through the comment section on the live stream. And I'll ask our IT team to recirculate the questions that we've gotten through. Um, but I also think that some people are wondering, uh, what are the pros and cons uh, of each of the two bills? If we can kind of go through that very quickly. I don't know who wants to take that. Looks like Ambassador Freed wants that one. Sure. Well, the principal advantage of deter is it's focused. That deters the, um, the, uh, the Rubio bill, um, Rubio Van Hollen bill, and it focuses only on Russian election interference. The principal disadvantage, well, it has two disadvantages. One, it's only election interference. And it's hard to imagine that we would not want to look at the sanctions tool should the Russians launch a major military assault on Ukraine. That's a war. Lots of dead people, refugees. It's hard to imagine we wouldn't want to use the sanctions tool in that case. Um, secondly, 
uh, deter is still in the banking committee. The bill is one major step uh, behind DASCA in terms of movement. And this is not a substantive reason to support it, but it's a real world reason to think that uh, DASCA is more likely to be the legislative vehicle should the Senate, should the Congress decide to pass a bill. So um, that's an operational advantage. And I think uh, DASCA has the substantive advantage of trying to focus on more than one thing at the same time, because unfortunately there are multiple vectors of bad Russian activity. Um, and if I can also ask our panelists, um, I'm not sure who wants to take this question, um, if the Global Mag Magnitsky Act can be expanded to include uh, cyber security and disinformation. And I'm just going to remind the audience that this is a pretty big um, um, current events issue. I don't know if you saw that uh, last night, uh, Bloomberg News reported this morning that last night the Department of Human Health Services um, uh, underwent multiple uh, cyber attacks and uh, disinformation campaigns. So this is something that's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Well, I'll take that one. Um, in, in, in short, the answer is yes, because the president can issue another executive order uh, and have Global Magnitsky apply in exactly the space you've alluded to. That's the, that's the machinery that we've inherited since IEPA was passed in 1977 as, ironically enough, a, uh, uh, in, uh, and as, as a way of reducing presidential authority under Trading with the Enemies Act, which was passed in 19, what, 17? So, I, I mean, Ambassador Freed raises the fundamental issue. And I noted in his paper, you know, if Russia were to resume war in Ukraine, what, what do we do? Um, and I noted in the paper, there was a footnote that, uh, that he uh, uh, and his partner uh, had. Presumably sanctions wouldn't be the only thing, which raises the whole question of uh, does, does hybrid war in Ukraine or straightforward war if it were to occur, what would, what would that constitute as a challenge to NATO? And I don't have the answer to that. Um, I'm simply suggesting that the forensic record with regard to the sanctions that exist, which indeed from a macro, macroeconomic point of view or from a strategic oil industry point of view, since they were the 2014 sanctions principally were directed at the energy sector. What has been the forensic result? And the answer is nothing. So why more? With respect to election interference, I'm persuaded by what the good work that the Senate has done and that the bipartisan commission has done, although I haven't had a chance to read the, the latter report fully, um, that we ought to be, and, there, and this calls for a major lift on the part of Congress and the executive branch to have a whole of government response in the cyberspace. And, you know, there is only so much work that could be done in any given legislative day. And of course, with the, with the pandemic upon us, who knows what the next few months will hold in the way of getting anything done. Um, but I would submit that in terms of election interference, the proper weapon is to have a comprehensive and robust deterrent. Ambassador Freed, it looks like you have a few comments to add to that. Sanctions against Russia over Ukraine accomplished two big things and failed to accomplish a third. The first big thing they accomplished was to convince Putin to back off his greatly expanded war aims. There was a period in 2014 when Putin started hinting that he was going to claim about one third of Ukraine's territory not just annexing Crimea and grabbing parts of the Donbass, but actually grabbing a third of the country. He floated the idea. He changed his mind when the West responded through sanctions. The second thing sanctions did was 
convince Putin to agree to the Minsk Accords, which actually recognize Ukraine's sovereignty over the Donbass. Now, sanctions failed to do a third thing. They failed to convince Putin to actually implement Minsk. And things have been stuck for about five years because of that failure. Well, why? Is that a failure of sanctions or Putin's calculation that the United States, particularly after uh, Trump became president, lacked the political determination to get Russia out of Ukraine. Putin may have assumed that the United States was sending mixed signals uh, suggesting that we weren't really determined. I think that was the case. I don't think sanctions have exhausted their potential. I also think sanctions cannot achieve everything on their own. I think Richard's right that we need a whole of government approach. I never liked the fact that the Obama administration was relying so heavily on sanctions as the principal vehicle of its support for Ukraine. I thought that was a mistake. I was doing what I could because that was my job, but I would have preferred a broader approach. So Richard's got a point, but I think that sanctions still have a place. Um, oil, now energy, a footnote about energy sanctions. We designed the energy sanctions when oil prices were between 90 and 100, $110 a barrel. And you know, now oil prices are what, Richard, 35, $40 a barrel? No, under 30. Under, thir under 30, okay. So look, they're a lot less effective. The financial sanctions are relatively more effective and don't forget the military technology restrictions uh, they are having a bite which increases over time. So the energy sanctions are relatively less effective however, in the short run. However, oil prices are not going to always be at 30. They're going to go up again. And when, it do, and when they do, those sanctions will start to bite. The cumulative effect of sanctions does grow over time. Um, the converse of that is you can't uh, embrace sanctions being in a hurry or being greedy. Um, one of the things I learned through decades in government is never promise a happy solution within the, the political time frame of your political masters. You know, it's not going to turn out well before the next midterm or even the next presidential election. It might turn well turn out well in the long term, but that may not satisfy um, you know, the, the, the political class, which we civil servants, um, which we civil servants um, you know, for whom we work. Uh, thank you. Um, so Carrie, I'll, I'll direct this one at you. Uh, we have an audience question about the maintenance clause in uh, the bills. How does that affect businesses? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that specific provision. Um, which, which one is it? This is, I think you're, t are, in, in EU sanctions language, you're talking about grandfathering present operations oh. in terms of maintenance of effort for operations that are presently active. Oh, so you're, yes. And, and this is what Ambassador Fried was talking about in, in the sense that they're prospective and not retrospective. So there would be provisions for new investment, restrictions on new investment and on anything going forward. Uh, I mean, I think that that goes hand in glove with, with the whole concept that the current administration has worked out uh, post CATSA, which is that for certain activities like the Deripaska sanctions or when you designate Rusal or Gaz, um, there has to be a, an understanding that activity going forward, uh, particularly if it's sectorally sanctions, as opposed to just a blocking, uh, would allow for uh, current activity either to continue or to unwind with a focus being on prohibiting any new activity. And that is just one of um, addressing the evolution in sanctions away from the, the you know, hammer to kill a mosquito concept of the old TWIA sanctions where you would have block jurisdictional restrictions on Cuba versus what we now consider the smart sanctions, which are list-based, or even the more nuanced sectoral sanctions, which seems to be the preference uh, going forward in the sense that you can put pain uh, by restricting certain activities trading in bonds where there's a, a, a longevity of over 14 days rather than just prohibiting all um, exchanges in debt. 
And we've seen that in the sectoral sanctions, but a component of that implicitly means that because the US and the Russian economies are so intertwined, you have to use the more nuanced, subtle approach. Um, there's also a provision within DASCA calling for coordination with the Europeans to close certain loopholes. And so I think this goes back to, to Graham's point, uh, which was that in order for the sanctions to really be useful, it, it's helpful if they're multilateral. And I think this and the, and the terms and the analysis are the same. So right now, when you look at U.S. sectorals, there's the understanding under U.S. law that uh, invoicing terms are included within the restrictions of the sectoral sanctions. The Europeans have taken the opposite view. Some view that as a loophole that must be closed, but from a practical perspective, uh, it really is something that multilateral coordination should be able to address. Um, I'm gonna, we're getting some great questions from the audience. Um, so just to remind you once again, you can uh, ask us questions on Twitter using hashtag shaping sanctions, the chat function on Zoom and uh, through the comment section on the live stream on Facebook. Uh, one question, I'm gonna ask Graham this question since you've been uh, in the last administration when we saw more multilateral action uh, in terms of sanctions, is there scope to work with the UK and the EU uh, to address some of the con global concerns with Putin and uh, what he's doing in Russia um, and how much of what Trump has done uh, through, you know, ending the JCPOA um, and uh, sort of halting some cooperation on a global level will be impacted by any efforts to get the U.S. to get a multilateral sanctions um, agreement to impose under Russia. Yeah, so that's a great question. I want to be very, very clear about what I did in the last administration. Uh, I was A, a civil servant, and B, I served as the advisor to the president's homeland security and counterterrorism advisor. And then consequently, uh, as a millennial who knew what the internet is, as a strategic communications advisor, uh, which is how I've come to this role as the, at the Digital Forensic Research Lab. Uh, so I was not in the weeds with OFAC and a number of the other kind of organizations across the uh, interagency dealing with uh, sanctions uh, policies specifically, whether or not it was uh, creating new sanctions or trying sometimes futilely to uh, to roll back old sanctions. Uh, it turns out that one of the hardest things to do when you're in the federal government is to uh, roll back sanctions that already exist. Uh, it takes an amount of coordination and consensus that is uh, almost unheard of uh, in these times in Washington, DC. Um, but to your question about whether or not the coordination needs to occur with partners in order to have an effective policy, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it, the thing that we know about not only financial systems, but also the information ecosystem is that it doesn't necessarily recognize our neatly defined borders. And so the market that we share with the UK, with the EU and others, and the market that is in some ways manipulated by Russian actors, oligarchs, things of that nature, if we don't have a plan for what happens in the real estate market in London uh, and how that relates to uh, any number of market, steel markets in the United States, uh, then we don't have much of a plan at all. Uh, that applies as well to the information ecosystem where uh, disinformation, how that spreads or malign influence operations online don't necessarily respect one platform, one country, or one media outlet. They're designed to uh, range across all of those things, whether that's uh, something that starts on social media and then drives up a bunch of engagement and then translates to mainstream media and then translates to a conversation among policymakers, right? Those are information ecosystems uh, that are mutually reinforcing. And so we need to have policy that deals with all of it all at once. Ambassador Free, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, Graham's right. And more generally, I would say that coordination with Europe is not only good in general, it's particularly good with respect to sanctions. Uh, in the Obama administration, my view is that sanctions negotiator was rather do, I'd rather do less with Europe than more unilaterally. But we don't have that choice right now. No, right now, the, the Trump administration has burnt through a lot of political capital with Europe for no good reason. Um, there are people in the administration who try to coordinate sanctions in general with Europe, but um, shall we stipulate that it's difficult? 
I mean, what's today's story? That the United States was seeking to corner the market on a potential coronavirus vaccine by buying out, buying it from a German company for exclusive US use? I hope that story's wrong. But if it is, it's not going to make it any easier to go to the German government and say, hey, let's plan now for combined sanctions uh, to guard against Russian interference in European or US elections. You see the point. Um, I wish we were not forced by political circumstance to rely on um, legislation or even consider national steps, but we are where we are. And I don't want our current difficulties and current circumstances to make us incapable of responding to potential Russian aggression. So yeah, Graham's right. And I'm just sort of foot stomping that. Um, and Richard, maybe I can direct this one to you. Um, when it comes to uh, more sanctions in the oil market, if, if, if any of these sanctions are triggered with, um, with these, what are these two pieces of legislation? I mean, right now the U.S. has sanctioned a lot of Venezuelan crude, Iranian crude, uh, and then there's going to be Russia, and then you have the background of what is going on, the disagreements with OPEC right now. Uh, does some of that need to be revised considering um, current events? Well, I, I think that <laughs> that uh, Ambassador Freed put it, put his finger on it, which is the market today is in free fall because of the play that uh, was initiated by, shall we say, MBS in response to Russian intransigence. I think it was the difference between checkers and chess um, by any macroeconomic measure that I'm familiar with. If you look at the Saudi budget that Saudi Aramco must service, um, the Russians have a much greater capacity to flood the market and absorb the consequences than the Saudis do, um, given their uh, budget needs currently. And both have no, uh, no affection for uh, the shale revolution that has been uh, played out in the United States over the last 15 years. Um, and clearly that uh, the, the, the shale production in the US um, is a prime near-term objective of flooding the market to regain market share. Um, what is worth noting is that sh shale production in the United States, I'm talking about oil, not gas. Um, it's true for gas as well, but gas is it's still a different market. Um, that the shale production in the United States is unlike conventional production in that, yes, you can, you can stop it. It can be turned off because you just stop drilling wells, you stop fracking, but it can be turned on again in a matter of months. And the overall domestic industry, um, I suspect is as a product of it, frankly, is resilient enough uh, that this too will pass. So sectoral sanctions that focus on the energy, on energy production when you're talking about Russia, which is a for all intents and purposes apart from arms, is a, is a one pony exporter, um, has, has some primary appeal. That's why when you walk the halls of Congress and you talk about sanctions in Russia, uh, the first thing is that you get that you hear is, well, we have to have energy sanctions. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna, oh yeah. Um, so we have more questions. Just, to, just to sum it up, I, I suspect, I, I go back to my original point. I mean, if you make a judgment that you don't, I'm going to put it baldly, you don't trust the current administration to do the right thing in the event of major Russian aggression 
in Ukraine, that's a problem. But it's a problem much greater than whether we pass a sanctions bill. Um, with respect to what Graham has been speaking about in the cyberspace, um, I really think that that is a situation that would be best addressed by doing a lot of hard work to reform our government procedures and have a whole of government resilient and robust cyber defense. Um, and Graham, we have a question from the audience for you. Um, could do you think that there's a scope for Russia to increase its aggression in the U.S., um, considering how overwhelmed we are here by the coronavirus? Yeah, so that's a rumor that, uh, well, not a rumor, but we've seen reports that uh, over the last 24 hours, there's a potential that uh, Russia was, is opportunistically globbing onto narratives about coronavirus to kind of stoke on fears and things of that nature. Um, I, I think it's way too early to make that hard attribution in, in this moment uh, as we speak. And so I don't want to do that just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, but I do think that as, as one of our best defenses against disinformation is having our antennas up to spot it and being aware about it. And so where Russian disinformation uh, has become a kitchen table issue in the United States and frankly in, in places across Europe well before the United States, uh, it's something that's good. That amount of attention drives up our resilience to it. Uh, well, our attention shifts to focus on other topics like COVID-19, uh, there is an increased vulnerability. Uh, so we can't let our guard down on this and on other issues. Uh, but it's something that, I, I mean, I think that where we have harder defenses in the hard cyberspace, uh, we have, we've kind of made more resilience in the hard cyberspace, or at least we know what the realm of the possible is in terms of what we could, what, what would be possible with like getting into election infrastructure and changing votes, things like that, as opposed to shaping narratives in the soft information space to drive people into further opinions. Uh, that's something that where we have a lot more vulnerability. That's what concerns me the most on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and it concerns me uh, not only on political topics like elections, but also on day-to-day -day news cycle issues uh, where there is opportunity to kind of seed narratives on the news of the day, whether that's COVID or on anything else. Right. And Ambassador Fried, we have a question for you on what are the chances of either Dosco or Deter passing, especially uh, considering how busy lawmakers are with uh, COVID packages? Well, in the immediate term, the odds are low, but the immediate term may be immediate. Um, DASCA has a fair chance of passing should the Russians take, be seen as taking advantage of either our preoccupation with COVID-19 or otherwise interfering in the elections. And I suspect that the Congress, as it did in 2017, um, could go from not moving at all to moving very quickly, which is one of the reasons we decided to have this, uh, to hold this event, because you, this could become a real life scenario um, very quickly. So I think that the odds are small until they become overwhelming. And that could happen soon. I would say later this summer. And, and a lot of times with Congress, it seems like it takes an event. I remember after the infamous Helsinki press conference, when the President Trump stood next to uh, Putin and uh, said that his own intelligence, the U.S. intelligence uh, community was incorrect in their statements about Russia. After that, there was a really big push for action from lawmakers. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is uh, make a last call for questions. And as we're waiting for those, I'm going to start with Carrie. And maybe you can give us some of your final thoughts before we close out the panel. Sure. Uh, I think that, you know, as much as I have, have been critical of DASCA, over the last um, hour or so, there are some things in here that are worth noting that that I don't think are, are negative. Uh, one of them is it highlights the use of geographic targeting orders. 
which is something, of course, that we're used to from the anti-money laundering world, where there's a specific focus on um, cash transactions or high value transactions in the real estate market that would otherwise go undocumented or unnoticed. I think that that is uh, a nice overlay with the attempts on the Hill to update the Bank Secrecy Act. And there seems to be uh, administration and bipartisan support for that type of activity. So I think that that um, is productive. It's also interesting to me that this document highlights the Interpol red notices and uh, the abuse that the Russians um, have been engaging with with some frequency in, in setting up uh, Interpol as a means through which to achieve their own political spheres. So I think comments like that are also useful to flag in, in pieces of legislation. Um, finally, I think that it also makes sense to uh, reevaluate whether it was appropriate to um, get rid of the Office of Sanctions Coordination. I think in times like today, uh, where the world is increasingly complex, it's helpful to have a central repository for that type of uh, information, especially um, when it requires multilateral support. And then finally, I also thought it was worth flagging that the DASCA calls out for the creation of a Russian fusion center across uh, the U.S. government, which I think, again, going back to Graham's comments and Richard's comments, uh, by frankly, everybody's comments, is it, it helps to have greater coordination and, and focus across the agency uh, on across the agencies on issues like this. And so I, I think that that the bill is not all all negative from my perspective. Graham, I'd like to hear from you. Sorry, I didn't have my finger on the unmute trigger. Uh, Listen, I think that this is a, an appropriate conversation to be having. I, it's very clear that we need more policy interventions in order to deter uh, this type of behavior from a country like Russia. Uh, one thing that we know, and I'll speak from the disinformation space, is that there is no cost to spreading disinformation or uh, or mounting concerted malign influence efforts. Uh, at least no costs that have deterred that kind of behavior. And so that's something that we remain uh, in need of and in want of. Uh, it, there are a number of examples from social science that would, that would indicate that things like sanctions uh, help us to achieve that, uh, but aren't enough because the one thing that we know is that as humans, we're uncomfortable being lied to. Uh, that being said, the thing that we prioritize a lot more than being uncomfortable being lied to is reaffirming our own basest beliefs. And so that's the social science variance that we're looking at in terms of domestic uh, disinformation, whether it comes from domestic sources or from foreign sources. And until we drive at that issue, as well as create a deterrent for those who would supply disinformation, whether that's Russian or domestic actors, we're at a loss for uh, for holistically solving this challenge. Hmm. Right, and um, Richard, I'd like to hear from you. I would simply sum up by saying, given the history of the sanctions on Russia and the ability of US companies in the face of those sanctions to maintain operations um, that in some cases go back decades, um, that the imposition of further sectoral sanctions, particularly in the financial space, where it would make it impossible to conduct business operations if you're a US entity, simply means get out of Russia. And I don't see that as um, a viable uh, cudgel with which to prevent or that would enter in very greatly into Putin's calculations about reigniting war in Ukraine. So, and while, while we're waiting for any final questions to come through, I haven't seen any yet. Uh, Ambassador Freed, your final thoughts. Well, first point is that it, it would be better not to be thinking about sanctions at all. Second point is that legislation is a decided second best all right all the criticisms for especially from richard and carrie about the downsides of legislative legislating sanctions are right the trouble is the alternative may be uncertainty or putin's assumption that he can get away with something 
And we're not talking about something trivial. The triggers in Daska are a renewed war against Ukraine or major assault on the American electoral system. Those are big deals and we should be prepared to respond. That said, sanctions have their cost. Carrie, uh, Carrie at the outset uh, mentioned a whole bunch of important steps that should be taken in parallel um, with reliance on a sanctions regime, principally staffing up OFAC to meet the demand, um, increasing its ability react nimbly in cases where licensing is needed. All of this is important. It's good governance, we should do it. Um, with respect to Richard's point about US companies and their, and their footprint in Russia, man, I, I get it. Um, there's a strong argument to be made for investing in a better, uh, in a better future with Russia. That's a good thing, but Richard, you remember what we talked about back in when I was in government. Um, Russia business in Russia comes with additional risks. Um, the risks of Putin's bad behavior. And the risks of doing business with Russia are not simply that the United States would behave in a retaliatory or arbitrary fashion. It's that Russia engages in behavior so egregious, we cannot stand by. There is an extra risk premium doing business with Russia. Businesses have known about this or should have known for a number of years. I don't look forward to a circumstance under which we launch sanctions, but I recognize that those circumstances may exist. And our final point, um, given where we are, with oil prices, energy sanctions are like to, likely to be less effective in the short run, but financial sanctions are likely to be more effective in the short run. Yeah, Putin may look at the numbers with Saudi Arabia and conclude that his reserves and the arithmetic suggests that he can win a war, you know, a, a, an oil price war with the Saudis in the short run. But hmm, he ought to be made aware of the fact that if he does if he has a, an oil price war with Saudi Arabia and at the same time escalates aggression against Ukraine and or the United States, um, we may, as the United States, change that dynamic. Um, the Russian economy is not invulnerable and Ru Putin acts as if he is politically mm, vulnerable to downturns. In, that gives us an opportunity to make it clear to Russia that there will be a price for Russian aggression. And I think that's, uh, that ought to be the way we go. Sanctions are sa a decided second best, but they may be necessary. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I wanna thank our audience for the wonderful questions and for tuning in while we're all working from home and remotely. Um, and also to thank all of our panelists so much and for Atlantic Council for organizing this. Stay well, everybody. Thank you.